Earlier this week, a meeting took place in the city of Belgrade, which was actually not covered so much by the media, but is of great significance. This was the 60th anniversary conference of the Non-Aligned Movement. Earlier, the Non-Aligned Movement was a key pillar of both Indian foreign policy and the foreign policy of many countries across the world. But what is its situation today? We are going to be discussing this in Mapping Fault Lines. We have with us Prabir Prakashtha. Prabir, so uh, the non-aligned movement, like I said, for instance, in our history textbooks, in the popular discourse, at least in the 80s and 90s, was something that a lot of people talked about. We were very proud about as Indians that we were one of the initiators of the non-aligned movement. But uh, a lot of people also understand the non-aligned movement as something that's neutral, or that's something that is not linked to the USA or the USSR, so, and maybe a third way. But is this understanding of uh, the non-aligned movement basically being a neutral bloc really accurate or what is the tradition behind it? You know, the word non-aligned appears to make the framing of the non-aligned movement that it is not aligned to the two military blocs that existed post the Second World War, which is the NATO as a fulcrum of one. Of course, there is also the Cento and the Seattle, which are all basically built with the, you know, by the United States as military alliances. Against whom? Clearly against the Soviet Union and China, but also as a way of asserting their dominance in these regions. The, comic, the, the communist countries at the time, the socialist blocs, were also militarily aligned. Of course, the Soviet Union and China had differences uh, after a certain point of time. But the, the dynamic of non-aligned movement did not come from the military alliances. It really came from the decolonization process, which had started post-Second World War. We got independence in 1947. So did a lot of countries slowly get their independence. And their basic battle at the time was still solidarity for those countries fighting for independence and to see that the post-independence period, they're able to develop what they wanted to do and they don't become new colonies. So therefore, the fight was against still colonial powers. Let's not forget, you can see Africa as one of the major uh, continents which enters the non-land movement. And we can see the number of countries in Africa which are still essentially under colonial rule. The battle against neo-colonial powers, as well as existing colonial powers, still not giving up their colonies. We had Portugal and Spain, who continued their, with their colonies till the 70s. All that was there. There was also, the, for instance, the Dutch supposedly give up their colonies. The Belgians give up their colonies, but they still fight for influence on being able to control it externally with US help. Right. So you had Patrice Lumumba being killed in Congo. You have, for instance, the Dutch still maintain their colonies in Indonesia. The West Papua New Guinea is still under Dutch uh, control. So all of this continues in this whole period, and let's not forget, Goa was still a Portuguese colony. Right. And in fact, when the Indians liberated Goa in the Security Council, a resolution move was moved against, the, against India by the United States and some of the other uh, friendly colonial powers of the Portuguese condemning India. And it was the veto given by the Soviet Union that stopped this resolution going through. Right. So decolonization was still looked upon as something which was contended. And the contention was not with the Soviet Union, China, and the US, uh, USA and its allies. It was between the non-aligned countries, as you just said, and also the colonial and ex-colonial countries. Right. That was the real battle. Right. So those who take not frame the non-line movement as something which is primarily not aligned militarily, forget the dynamic of the non-line movement, and Bandung Conference makes this very clear, as also the, all the statements in the non-line movement also makes it clear, it was really about decolonization, and the non-line movement's primary task was to support countries which are fighting for liberation, as well 
for countries which had already got independence but were fighting to build an independent economy and so on. But if you see the original map and you have it over here, you will see the non-land movement was really Asia and Africa. That was the fulcrum of the movement and it expands to Latin America later. So of course you have the Caribbeans also who come in, Latin America which comes in, but it started really as an Asian and African initiative. Right. You have Algeria, of course, a colonial war was being fought and people tend to miss this element when they talk about the non-line movement. Absolutely. Prabhupada, in this context, uh, after the non-line movement was established in 1961, we had maybe around another 30 years of its existence at a time when there were basically these two camps. And of course, we do know that over time, the USSR also, USSR and the socialist camp also established close relations with the non-aligned countries. So what exactly was the role of the non-aligned movement in those three decades? You know, the, apart from the supporting of the liberation movements, one of the major issues that came up was, of course, the apartheid regimes. You had earlier Rhodesia, which declared its independence as a white uh, state, which would oppress, had the right to oppress its uh, African uh, people, people of African origin, who were, the, of course, the majority in uh, so-called Rhodesia. Then, of course, you had South Africa. And South Africa at that point launches wars against uh, uh, both Angola and Mozambique. And of course this issue comes up, apartheid regimes then come up repeatedly in the United Nations, including South Africa's attack on these two countries. Again, in this period, particularly the 70s and 80s, the United States with its allies continuously exercises its vetoes against liberation struggle. So I think this is <clears throat> very clear that they start suddenly realizing that the dominance they had over the, after the Second World War with France, UK, other colonial powers, that that dominance in the world was slowly slipping and these countries, the newly liberated countries were asserting their voice. Right. And that was something which they did not want. And that is the battle then that takes place in the United Nations, in other economic fora, all other UN uh, agencies which are then also caught into the struggle. Mm -hmm. And if you see this, <coughs> It's after the fall of Soviet Union, you slowly come back to what today is being talked about as the new international order in which uh, the rules are going to be set by a certain set of countries. So Praveen, in this context, the bigger, one of the biggest challenges before the non-aligned movement really was the post-91 scenario. The USSR falls, the entire socialist bloc falls. For a while, it looks like the United States is the preponderant power and the only one that has any kind of say in the world affairs was the non-line movement actually at that point able to meet the challenges or you know able to actually stand up and uh, perform its role you know i think what people do not realize that how much the socialist bloc allowed the decolonization process to take place and why de facto there was an understanding between the uh, decolonizing powers, the ex-colonies, and the socialist bloc, because without that, this decolonization process would have been hamstrung. Not going to say it would never have happened, but I think it would have been deeply hamstrung. And I think that was a new fulcrum of the world politics, that how the decolonized world was developing an independent economic outlook towards the world, building their own internal economies in a way they wanted to. Some, of course, wanted hyper-capitalism. A lot of them had common policies, which were basically independent national economies, mm -hmm. building industries, and so on. Now, that changes, as you said, with the fall of Soviet Union and the socialist bloc. China still remains, Vietnam remains, Cuba remains, but most of the others have fallen. So what happens after that is a sense of weakness, a sense of loss that with the current conditions as it exists, do we have any alternative but to surrender to the sole global hegemon, the United States. And then you start having different kinds of people say, the world has changed. We have to make up the United States. We have that in India as well. This independent foreign policy has no meaning. Right. The only 
foreign policy that makes sense is how do we uh, make build our relations with the United States? How do you invite them to develop our economies? What is it that we give in lieu? And so on. And you can see across the board, even in South Africa, where you have uh, independence or independence of the apartheid regime takes place. Even there, there is a loss of confidence that can we actually fight the global hegemon or should we have to surrender in some form or the other? And you start talking about that capitalism is the only path, that you have to then accept the WTO diktat about opening your economies, and you have a whole bunch of invasive uh, trade regimes that come in, WTO of course being one of them. But the main issue was really I would say recolonization of the world again. And the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, WTO, all these institutions then act as instruments of again the same forces right. which were the ex-colonies, of course now led by the United States. And United States is post Second World War the most economically dominant power, military also the most dominant power in the world. It has even today about 800 bases. So that was the sense of loss that people had. But you know, things seem to be changing. And we have a situation again, where the issues of, of course, China, uh, US competition on one hand, European Union, the role of Russia, what is, should be its relations with the European Union, all these issues are again coming. And with Afghanistan, the 20 years of occupation in Afghanistan having failed. And this, the so-called war on terror, which was another way of trying to increase American hegemony in West Asia, for example, and Central Asia. All that seems to have come unstuck, particularly with the failure of the American military uh, attempts in Afghanistan. So I think this also, there is Iraq war, which is also doesn't seem to be going in American America's favor. Right. So given all of that, are we entering a new era in which we will get not non-alignment, because I don't think we can put the old wine in new bottle, but can we actually get something else which will give in the post unipolar world, what is the new configuration we are likely to see? I think that's an interesting question. I'm not sure we can go back to non-alignment because right. non-alignment was also important because there are two military blocs. China has said it's not interested in having military blocs. It has only one uh, base uh, in Africa, Djibouti. And also, if you take uh, Russia, it has very limited military bases in the world, if you know you can call them bases, really a few posts somewhere, some uh, presence in Syria, particularly because of the attack that Syria has been facing. But if you see, they are not interested in playing the same role right. that the United States plays, mm -hmm. and even France plays in Africa. So question is, how do we see this new world, which is post-unipolar world? How will it happen? What will be the role to be played? Does non-alignment have a role or not? Are important questions. But I do believe that strategic autonomy of countries like India is very important. And I think a whole number of countries would like to assert their strategic autonomy. Can that come together in some form with a unified policy, both economic and political? Question mark. Thank you so much, Rubir. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching News Click.